Um, so yeah, great to be here. Um, as Alexi said, I, I don't really get out of the South Bay much, which is probably my own fault, but I'm um, uh, very busy at work and things. Uh, uh, next year will be my eighth year in the Scala community. Um, been around for kind of a long time now and uh, worked on a lot of different projects. Uh, was one of the first five committers to Akka, um, wrote a book about Lyft, did a bunch of other stuff, um, and now I'm an architect at Verizon. Um, I mainly work on very large distributed applications at Verizon building uh, infrastructure, so um, high-speed inter internode communication inside data centers, um, massive monitoring, do billions of events a week through Scala Stream, um, very into functional programming. Uh, um, it's myself, Runa Bjarsson, um, uh, Stu O'Connor, Cody Allen, um, lots of Scholar Z guys. Uh, we like it. We like functional programming. Um, we do a lot of that. And uh, tonight I'm going to be talking to you about um, something a little bit odd. Uh, it's the Enigma machine. Um, so who knows what the Enigma machine is? Okay, good, yeah. Right crowd. So um, uh, today, interestingly, actually, um, uh, it's the 73rd anniversary of, of breaking the M4 Kriegsmarine Enigma, so, uh, which is totally a serendipitous event. But, uh, um, uh, that's kind of a, an interesting thing. So uh, for those who haven't seen it, um, uh, this is an Enigma machine. So um, um, Enigma machine is kind of designed, uh, the, pro the problem is that the, uh, the commanders wanted to encipher their messages um, between the uh, central command and, and the, uh, 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 the units out in the field. So in this particular case, uh, the one I decided to implement was the one for the Army and the, and the, uh, the Air Force. Um, the one for the Kriegsmarine, the Navy was kind of Complicated, so um, not that it would be difficult to implement. It's just a kind of run out of time, what with work and everything else. So, um, anyway, so this is the Kriegsmar uh, This is the uh, uh, the M3 Enigma machine, um, uh, and this is the lady who who broke it, who was working at Bletchley Park 73 years ago today, which I think is really really cool. Um, so uh, her name is Mavis Betty. So um, anyway, so uh, just going to talk about the parts, and then we'll talk about how they're implemented, and um, you know how uh, decided to implement this for pure functional programming. Then we can talk about monads and some other interesting stuff. Um, so the first part is the Steckerbrett, uh, which is this, this part at the bottom of the machine. And what it basically is is you have um, um, uh, sort of given an A, if A maps to Z, and if you give it a Z, then Z A maps, maps to A. So um, you basically these two-pronged two uh, plugs, and you kind of plug one end at one end, and plug it onto the other character, and then you know you kind of got maximum of a, a maximum of 11 plugs. And, uh, um, that would be how you would uh, uh, you would configure that part of the machine. Um, they kind of mix those around, and, and so originally when the machine was originally devised in 1918, it didn't have that. Uh, that was actually added later by the Germans during the war. Um, so second part, <coughs> which is the most interesting part, uh, are the rotors. So they come in these uh, kind of interesting um, uh, interesting kind of group of three connection, and they have, as you can see on the left hand side, uh, also on the right hand side. Uh, they have these pins, and each pin is a, a part of a connector that connects to the next, the next rotor. And so you can see on, uh, on, on this part, I don't know, it's not very high resolution, but uh, this part right here, um, it's part of a turnover point. So each rotor has this kind of sort of three vectors of change. So one is, one is the, um, the, the connectors, and the connectors kind of rotate like on a bezel uh, like next to uh, the actual rotor in the positions of the rotor. And then the second part is that turnover point. So there's kind of these latches that are kind of latching down um, as the machine is turning over, um, and that actually shifts the next one on. So the furthest rotor is the fastest rotor, and now that's rotating each time, and then um, the next one is rotating uh, based sort of on a random, depending on the configuration, and then the next one uh, is rotated again. So you kind of end up, that was how they kind of made it uh, much more deterministic from well, I guess from the Allies' perspective, it wasn't the same. So if you type uh, you know, H and then you type H again, then you get a different output. So um, it's a simple substitution cipher, but it actually was. Um, so the next part is the reflector, which is one of the main things that makes the whole machine work, uh, which is a bit on the end. Uh, so it's actually this part right here. So if you imagine it, if you imagine the other diagram, electrical signal comes in goes down to the reflector, reflector then ma maps that. So let's say that uh, the output was like a K, it will map like K to X, and then push it back through the machine the opposite way. Um, so you kind of get this like twofold in ciphering like with one pass of the electrical current going you know, out to, through the rotors, out to the reflector, and then you know, back through again. Um, so kind of logically, um, uh, by the way, I must say, borrowed most of these images from the cryptomuseum.com uh, uh, site, which is an awesome site if you like cryptography. Um, and I borrowed this one from a uh, and it's also a really great site uh, with information about Enigma and like several other cryptographic uh, uh, devices. So uh, this is basically the process that I was just outlining. Um, 
which is kind of interesting if you consider that this is all being done with like actual wires that connect actual things to other things. So this is all, all kind of a, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to implement in software, but sort of the monolithic task they would have had to done when they were actually first devising this is kind of incredible. So um, there are actually 158 quintillion possible options of, of outputs for any given thing, given all the rotors, uh, all the possible configurations, all the turnovers, all the ways that they could be configured together. Um, so that kind of give the, uh, that give the Germans a fairly, fairly high degree of confidence. Um, uh, interestingly, actually, if anyone's read anything about the, uh, uh, why it actually got broken, it was just the human factor that really kind of broke it because, well, they just, they end up, it was like salutations and kind of, they would end up realizing that, hey, that we've seen this kind of, this kind of writing before and stuff like that. So it was kind of like the human factor that really kind of broke it in the end, despite all these possible options. Um, and despite the operators being told not to do that. Uh, so I guess humans. Um, and then, so just from a key perspective, if anyone's going to say, aha, but this is going to be like a key problem, how do you do to the key distribution? So um, the keys, if you like, are kind of like the configurations of the machines. And what they would do is they would have this day sheet, and then you would say, sort of first part of your message, you would say, okay, like day one, I'm using day one, which should then imply, you know, that day one would be transferred in the clear. So that would be the bit how receiving the message, you would then look at your day sheet, and then you would figure out how it was that your machine should actually be configured. Um, in this case, you can see, use the B reflector, this wheel, this wheel, this wheel, where the rings configured, the grounds, and then put all the plugs in, and, and so on. And they would typically do them with a month. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, Kriegsmarine vessels often had two, because then they were submersed sometimes, so they didn't get, they didn't get, uh, uh, didn't get messages. So, demo time. I can just pull this over here. How do I get that over there? Let's just turn on mirroring for a second. Mm. Okay, good enough. Does everyone see that okay? I guess, oh, okay, it's okay. All right, so if I take a, hello. So it translates it. So if I give it something more, this is a test, test, test. As you can see that, um, oh, actually I've got a bug there. Hmm, interesting. Well, so um, if I then give it, uh, let's see now, give the test back. What's that? Mm, on this machine it is, yes. So, um, yeah, so then it converts the output, the, uh, the output of text, if I give it KP, uh, KPHN again back, uh, gives me the input. Um, so it, it's delimited by this kind of four character spacing. Uh, that was just the way they, 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 they did messages. So if I give it, if I give it a bunch of input, um, it will then translate it in, and that's just the way that they, display, they displayed messages. So, um, so interesting thing about this, let's get rid of that. Uh, how do I turn my mirroring off? <coughs> Okay, PowerPoint now seems to have gone away. Where has that gone to? Sorry, PowerPoint decides to have disappeared off the screen, which is very inconvenient right now. Uh, I really hate the why they've done it like this. Why doesn't that work? So let me just see if I can get my PowerPoint back. Seems to have disappeared. That probably teach me for not using Keynote. Okay, there we are. All right. Like all Microsoft products, it needed restarting. So. All right, let's just jump forward a second. Mm. Wow, that was totally not smooth, so. Uh. All right, there we go. So then when we start to think about how we're going to design this, obviously these actual electrical parts, they, um, you know, how are we going to implement them? So we've got kind of, th sort of four logical groups, um, uh, plug board, the reflector, um, uh, I haven't included the um, uh, 
uh, well, the reflector is kind of a rotor, but well, that's an implementation detail. Uh, the rotors and then obviously the machine itself. Um, so kind of thinking about all of this, this is kind of like they're all just character to character functions. Um, apart from, of course, there are, there are multiple parts of them. So when I start to think about this uh, and think about how they actually, like, things are typically implemented, um, I always try and break things down into the smallest unit of work um, and the smallest unit of, of, of refer referentially transparent work. Um, in this case, they're all char to char, so we're kind of just composing functions. Um, now, the tricky thing with the Enigma is, is, as I was mentioning, there are these turnover points. So it's kind of like this latch that's moving around with each wheel, um, which kind of makes, that's what makes it different every time. Um, now, um, interestingly, so we've swapped some code. We then start to model this just using case classes. Uh, so we build an algebra for, okay, here's my rotor. The um, properties of a rotor are, uh, rotor are, you know, what wiring does it have? You know, where is its ring configuration? What notches? What notches the turnover notch? Uh, and in what position am I currently on? So uh, evidently, this will, be, this will allow us to uh, have an immutable representation of our Enigma machine and allow us to basically compose a pipeline of functions that will execute sort of one letter transformation. Um, so this is actually how the whole program works when you actually um, encounter the uh, adding complexity of how to actually handle the state. So this part, uh, see, this part is just that function transformation, or you know that that, that char to char essentially. So it's kind of like okay, let's just execute one character as as, as a shot, and then this part is uh, if you like the state management. So what happens is um, like. Mechanically, which is why I kind of like this example because it's very mechanical, the thing is actually happening. Like um, it, it rotates and then the electrical signal goes through. So um, it kind of transla translates kind of nicely. Um, so we just we get the current state in the machine and then we modify, 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 um, and we'll talk about specifically what these do in a second. Um, and then then we say, okay, given the new state of the machine, like execute the function and just pass in uh, pass in the given character. So this is just regular function composition, and this part is, is and it's being done in the context of a state monad. So um, let's look at the implementation. So what is a state monad? So um, actually, who doesn't know what a monad is? Nope. Okay, one person. Okay, one person being honest with us. So that, that's good. So, um, uh, my original version of this slide had a bunch of, I was like, who knows what a monad is? Bunch of algebra, and then uh, they're the monad laws. But then I feel that would kind of be like uh, uh, anyway. So, so monads uh, on the basis that for the concept of well, for the sake of discussion, everything with a map and a flat map is a monad. Obviously, there are a set of laws that you apply to, and that's what Scala did. Scala said does actually enforce that. But, um, for the sake of this discussion, um, a state monad is is kind of like it's just a function. Give it a state, it will return you a new state and an A. So that's all there is to it. And like many monads, it's, it's, a, it's just a very simple mechanism that can be used to provide very interesting higher level abstraction. Um, so if we were going to implement this kind of like, um, I mean, the canonical example is a cache. Um, typically what people do is they have some var and then they like, you know, do something and then they like write the var and then like, you know, then they give back some answer and then kind of got this hidden thing about the fact that the var was updated or some cache was updated. Um, can make that referentially transparent by simply giving a cache, doing some processing, giving a return cache, and then whatever value it was you cared about, which, as it happens, is exactly this. Now, our state for Enigma machine is actually machine. It is actually that machine algebra. So, if we were going to implement state monad, what would it actually look like? So, um, the implementation in Scholar Z, if you go and look at it, is actually implemented in terms of um, a, a, state, a state monad transformer in the category of ID. Um, it's kind of if this is kind of new to you, that's probably going to be a bit overwhelming, so I simplified, and this is what essentially you have. So you have a map, you have a flat map, in order to allow to use four comprehensions. Then we have a run, so given an S, uh, give us the S and uh, the S, S A pair, uh, just like we were talking about, and then uh, modify, which is given an S, give me another S, uh, put some state as a side effect, and then get the existing state. Um, and then this bar is kind of the magic which actually does the function application, but um, Oh, I say magic. Magic is, is wrong. This just does regular function application. There isn't. It's just very obvious. So, um, if we're going to implement those map and flat map, how would they look? They would look exactly like this. Um, again, simplified from the from the uh, the version that's in Scala Z, uh, only because there's some other magic in there about using functors and other things, which for the sake of a small sli slide. So I just implemented this, and it, this 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 will work as 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 needed. Um, 
So, like, what is state mode add? So, st like I said, state mode is just it's simply threading your computation without you actually explicitly having to say. So, like all mode monads, it's just for those who haven't used it but have used other monads like uh, future or option. In the case of future, the sort of context is the fact that it's an asynchronous computation that may fail. Um, in the case of and it's just something that may or may not be there, and you're still doing you're still executing a function on it. In the case of state, you're just executing something else where the state is already present, and you just you just never call out. It's kind of implicitly carried around by the contextual use of this monadic device, and that that's all it is. Um, as I mentioned, the actual implementation uh, in Scala Z is more complicated, and and so anyone that has worked with it will be like, aha, this is kind of overflow, because one of the things that this does do is this, you end up with kind of layers and layers of recursion. Um, and so anyone who's read Runar's paper, uh, Stackless Scala, uh, and Stackless Scala and free, free categories and things like that, um, uh, you can just basically negate that and, and trade putting stuff on the stack for putting, um, um, basically back to the heap, and then you can avoid stack overflows by using state mode by simply saying, my state is de defined as a state T uh, trampoline S of A. And that is actually very, uh, uh, very convenient. Um, and that, by the way, um, the trampoline is just trampoline A, uh, and it's a free function zero A, so that is also just very simple. Um, so um, anyone who's looking at the previous slide would say, okay, like, well, how exactly do these right, middle, and left things work? Because, well, that, they seem to be the crux of the application, no. And so so that, that would indeed be right, and that is the bit that is actually kind of given our state, like actually doing some application on this, you know, actually doing some modification of that state. So uh, I'm using another kind of functional interest, uh, which is called lenses. And, um, and so the actual program looks like this. Uh, those right, middle, and left, all they do is uh, they bump on the next one, or, you know, they step, they step the rotor, and they, or they don't step the rotor, depending on whether or not they are the, you know, the right, middle, or left rotor. So probably looking at this thinking, well, what on earth is this thing? Because the rest of it, but I'm not really too sure what this magic operator does. It's not a Scala Z operator, it's actually a monocle operator. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but lenses, lenses are kind of this thing about, I've got some value, and I want to, to read the value, and I want to see the value, and I want to do so in a referentially transparent way. Um, so, anyone who's used a case classes in Scala will probably be familiar with copy. Um, you know, that's the obvious one. Works it great if you've got, if you've got like one layer of ADT, then it would be fine. Uh, nearly all domains that you care to work in that are in any way interesting typically have like nests of those or with a tree of kind of domain objects. Like, you know, the canonical plus I've got a person who's got an address and the address has like, you know, all this kind of stuff and you get with like multiple layers of kind of, you know, uh, product types. And it's not that useful really. It becomes very noisy very quickly. So. Lens to the rescue, essentially, rather than doing something like this. Uh, in my case, not the end of the world because I've only got two layers, but you know, I, 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 we can definitely do better. We can make these updates more compositional. Um, so I say no to this. And instead, again, massively simplifying concept of a lens, but this is, this is, I'm doing this as a vehicle to kind of explain. I can have the implementation and the use all in one slide, and it's, it's, it's very straightforward. There's no magic here. It's a simple function application wrapped up in of useful kind of way. So uh, lens just takes an A, uh, given an A and a B, uh, the get, give me an A, I'll tell you the B. So essentially like, if I've got case, case class personal and I want to operate on the age, then I'll, you know, underscore dot age kind of thing. So it would, uh, and the setting is obviously the inverse, give me a new age and I'll give you a new person with that age. Um, or in this case, as you can see, uh, the rotor, what position are we interested in? Because we're stepping around each time, we're actually incrementing that, incrementing that rotor for, for example, the furthest rotor right, uh, is implementing its position every single time. So we just copy that and we say, okay, position. Uh, this is a simplification, of course, but. So lenses. Uh, essentially, they allow you to build modular functions to compose updates of various, or any, any type of domain type. Um, so Scala Z does ship with a lens. Um, it's kind of grown in complexity over time. It was very simple. It did used to just fit in one Scala file. Now it's like a whole set of Scala files and different things and, you know, and, and that just kind of, it, it, it's, it's nice and it works, but it, it's, it's a little bit boilerplate-y because you end up having to kind of define all these things for every single type you, 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 wanted, you want to use and it just, it's, it's not that nice. So, so 
um, some enterprising young soul has come along and uh, um, made this library called Monocle. Um, and so Monocle is um, basically just removing the boilerplate of operating with lenses by using macros. And so rather than you having to say, I want a lens for this particular field, this is how I'm going to do the getting, this is how I'm going to do the setting. So if you have any kind of product or any kind of class, a case class, for example, that's the typical one that people want to use, say, hey, give me a lenser for this case class, and then it will figure out, and you say, and then you can optionally say later, like, I want these fields, and it will figure out which, what things need to be generated for that. So it, it's just essentially a macro-based code generation step that's, you know, okay, code generation, but it's a phase of the compiler, so, you know, this is a, you know, it's essentially code generation, but just code generation you just never see. So, um, it's really great, I gotta say, like, like this, this library is actually really, really great, so let's look at what that actually looks like. So, this is the all lenses for the whole thing being used in, in this Enigma machine. And then I can say, given a machine, I uh, can say pipe dash arrow, and uh, give which rotor do I need, or which other lens do I need to operate on, so then I can say, okay, I can have this kind of generic thing that even any lens knows how to operate on any rotor, and then I just need to pass in a lens for the actual rotor I care to work on. So then I can just kind of plug and play this whole thing uh, you know, d without actually ever having to, that kind of gnarly kind of nested, okay, I need this, read the value, and then actually having to reference the properties, I can just pass in the right lens that would do the right operation, uh, you know, modification of the current position of whichever lens I need. Um, there's some really kind of non-trivial stuff in, in Monocle, if anyone's kind of interested in looking at it, but it, it, is a, uh, it is a fascinating library, and it allows you to do lots of other interesting things. So, um, in fact, actually, all the type level.org projects are really, really awesome. So, um, anyway, just blowing through a bunch of stuff. I know we only had like 30 minutes, so, um, so quick roundup. Um, I, th I think the thing for me, like, e even uh, as I mentioned at the start, it, even though this is a toy application, we actually build our large production systems like this. It's not, it's not like this is just some kind of, like, arbitrary thing that, that doesn't really work in the, in the real world and it's great for kind of like academic curiosities. We build large distributed systems like this by breaking our systems down into small referentially transparent pure functions and we model everything like that and it works perfectly and it actually is very easy to maintain. So I, I like it because, you know, I always like to say it gives you this frame to reason about problems in a, a very simple and straightforward manner and it just, it's just not, it's very unambiguous because it's very explicit. Um, so state monad, gives you explicit immutable control over state changes. Um, I really like it, I think it's a fun little data structure. Um, I think there's a lot of other great things in Scholar-Z, so again, if you're not, uh, if you're not at all using Scholar-Z, validation, uh, Scholar-Z dot disjunction, or dot uh, backwards slash forward slash, otherwise known as disjunction, uh, is a great data structure, much more powerful than the Scholar dot either. Um, yeah, I could talk about that stuff for, for days. I think that's really, really great. Um, lenses make up being nested, nested domain types convenient and composable. Uh, composition is kind of the running theme here. Um, things that are highly reusable because they are compositional are far more effective than things than, than subtyping and all that kind of just just ghetto of sub programming. It just is really not awesome. So focusing on behavior and kind of functions that deliver certain types of behavior is a much more maintainable path of, of, of building large systems. Um, um, and finally, like I said, you know, I just couldn't believe that this is like the 73rd year of breaking Enigma, so I think it was an incredible piece of engineering, electrical engineering in 1918, so, um, yeah, that's really awesome. So, code is all on GitHub, um, if anyone's interested in talking about it or uh, wants to talk about anything else to do with Scholar-Z or type level, I, I would happily talk about it, and uh, with that, I think I will retreat to my back cave, and, uh, uh, yeah, happy to take any questions if anyone has them. Thank you very much. The, the what, sorry? The imitation game. Oh, really? Oh, I was not aware of that. The Bletchley Park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yep, um, using Shapeless heavily at work, yep. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, Monocle is actually relying on Shapeless. It does actually use IS ISOs under the hood. Um, so, what's the difference? Uh, one is built on top of the other. 
probably be the answer. Um, I haven't used Lens and Shapeless. I'm mainly using the HList, like everyone else in, in, in Shape, everyone else using Shapeless, primarily using it for its HLists. Um, HLists and I, so that's the main thing I'm using sh uh, Shapeless for. So I can't comment directly on, on Shapeless's Lens implementation, um, other, because primarily the main thing that's useful about Monocle is just the fact that it has that macro support. So it just kind of makes it much less boilerplate uh, because of the macro support. That's the, probably the only benefit. But, um, um, the, the implementations, as I said, it's like it's a pair of functions, so there's not really too much. There's not too much to move, if you know what I mean. So. Would you mind backtracking to the sure. program? This one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's the middle? The middle rotor. It, it's this one. So basically, we go right, middle, left. And um, because of the way it works, so basically, we modify the state. The state is only modified with sort of one of the curious things about an enigma is that because it only, it only it sort of uh, modifies the positions, and then it will pass the current through. So the current goes all the way in, and it goes to the reflector, and then it comes all the way back. So um, that's kind of what you end up with here. You kind of pass it through the plug board, and you know, pass it through you know, the, in, the rotors right to left and then um, put it through the reflector, transform it, and then go left to right, and then go back through the plug board, and then uh, so just apply that whole kind of function, which is kind of backwards for how we typically think about imperative programs. Um, you know, and I guess that was kind of why I was kind of enjoying this, because I think it's, a, uh, I think it's an interesting thing. Like if you totally ignore this, this program still, this is like another program. Like all we're doing is we're building a program from smaller programs. And that's basically the way to build large distributed systems. Programs of programs of programs, and they just all compose together. And, and that really just works really nicely. What's, what's C? Oh, C is an input character. Yeah, sorry, that will, the def was missing from here, yeah. But yeah, all, all that is, is just, it's, just uh, it's called def run, and then just takes one argument, which is a character. Um, but actually, uh, let me pull the code up. That'll actually be easier to see. But the um, uh, just pull this over here. Uh, uh, Enigma. Uh, where are you going? Oh, there we go. Okay. So. Yeah. So. Um, this is actually the kind of neat bit. I don't know if you can see this. It's bigger. Yeah, so, so this, bit, this bit is the kind of interesting curiosity. So um, this is the program. Um, and then all I've done is, uh, in order to do multiples, actually, this I should have put on the slides, actually. Um, so yeah, thank you for asking. Because when you use it, you actually want to give it like multiple characters. So um, you just say, OK, I'll just take like any number of characters, convert it to a vector. Um, and then I map over it basically just to make sure they're all uppercase because the way the mapping works, we only deal with uppercase letters. Um, and then we filter it, make sure that uh, it's actually a, like it wasn't kind of like a, uh, like a period or some other space or something that's not, not actually an A to Z letter. And then this is the interesting thing, which is traverse you run, um, which is just, if you've never seen that before, it's just the mind bending piece of unapply magic in Scala Z. So uh, this, this part. The uh, bottom part is basically just, so eval, I should just finish mentioning those. So just turn it, group it to a string. Like I said, that's just a curiosity of the formatting. And then eval is basically that, when we were talking about giving an, uh, that S, uh, S, give me an S and I'll give you an SA pair, um, this is basically just the application of, of that, which is give me the S, which in this case is a machine. So if we scroll up, we can say um, da, 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 run. So run is the one which actually gives you this state machine, state machine char, and then just the program. Um, so all that thing is is just it's basically saying okay, like um, if you've ever used um, future dot traverse or anything like that, traverse you, a traverse in, in Scala Z are um, basically just generified forms of that for any for any traversable uh, or any structure that has a traversable can use traverse and traverse you. I, well, well it's, for traverse you, you need an apply, but that's an implementation detail. Um, but yeah, so then basically all we do is we build up kind of like a sort of vector of multiple states, and then we just reduce them. And, that, and, and then we just run. So basically kind of under the hood, they all get flat mapped together, and then you just run them. Because you've, you've got one of them as opposed to the list of them. So it's kind of like just like future dot traverse, but it's just a generic version of that. And machine, is machine the case class? Is all the that's right. 
So Machina, uh, yeah, Machina is this one. So does that mean that for every, that every character that's activated, because there's a new state that comes out of, of that one character, then it affects what character is produced? That, that, that's right. So, so you basically, um, so the next question from someone will probably be, well, obviously, isn't that a lot of allocation? And in this particular case, yeah, I'm not trying to optimize anything like that. But yeah, it, there is uh, in every single time where m machine is kind of like the position will be, kind of, let's say we start in AAA position. It will be like A, B, C, D, kind of, you know, for each rotor kind of thing. So um, each rotor is just having its, its, uh, its position incremented each time. So that, that in the case of the, uh, uh, the rightmost rotor, it will be A, B, C. So each machine, kind of each copy, each step, each character that's input, it's kind of moving that position forward every single time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, do we have any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Yeah.